Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many people here tonight. Um, so my name is Katie Wilson. I'm a co-founder of the Seattle Transit Riders Union, and uh, I'm going to be your MC this evening. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the University Bookstore for uh, generously hosting this event. Also, thank you to Red May Seattle and 350 Seattle for co-sponsoring this event along with the Transit Riders Union. So, um, how many of you out there rode public transit to get here tonight? Sweet! Okay, and how many of you would choose public transit more often if it were free? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, so we are here tonight to explore the vision of free public transit. Um, we're going to hear about some real life examples of transit systems that have gone fare free. Um, and we'll talk through some of the advantages and also some of the challenges to achieving that vision. We'll also hear about some of the progress that we've made right here in Seattle and King County, um, as well as some possible next steps. And finally, we'll talk about a campaign going on right here now in the U District uh, that we need your help to win. Um, after the speaker program, which should probably take us till around 7 p.m., um, we'll have probably about half an hour for some questions and back and forth discussion. Um, and then there'll be half an hour after that till the bookstore closes for uh, informal conversation and uh, uh, purchasing the elusive book, which is not yet here. Um, so without further ado, um, I am honored to introduce our featured speaker for this evening, Rosalie Ray, um, who is an author of the new book, Free Public Transit and Why We Don't Pay to Ride Elevators. Uh, Rosalie Ray is a PhD student in urban planning at Columbia University, a research fellow at Transit Center, and a member of the bargaining committee for the graduate workers of Columbia UAW Local 2110. <laughs> I know there's a lot of union folks in the room, so that's appreciated. Um, her dissertation, which is just beginning, focuses on how planners, politicians, and activists fought in London, Paris, New York, and Seattle. Before, before coming to Columbia, she worked as an economist at the US Department of Transportation and got a master's in planning from UCLA. So please join me in welcoming Rosalie Ray. Sorry, we have a clumsy up. mic switch here. All right, well, thank you so much, Katie. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. And thanks to the Transit Writers Union, to the University Bookstore um, for hosting. And also thanks to everybody on the panel. Um, rather than read from the book, which isn't here, um, or, and also I only wrote a chapter, and that chapter is on the US. Um, so I figured I'd try to sort of um, highlight some of the key findings, some of the coolest examples, um, and just provide a little overview to set the frame for the discussion. Um, so the premise of the book is um, that transit should be conceived of as a necessary object to connect places, like an elevator, and not as a commodity, a luxury, or a service. And implicit in this reframing of transit as a necessity are three arguments, sort of economic efficiency, environmental sustainability, and uh, the coolest argument, the equity and rights-based argument, right? Like we should have a right to public transit and a right to public transit means it cannot be um, limited based on the ability to pay. Um, so sort of across the dozen or so countries included in this book, which comprise 200 cities that have implemented or explored some form of free public transit. Um, and I should first of all say that free public transit is def defined pretty broadly in the book. Um, the ideal version, right, is no enforcement, no barriers, no payment whatsoever, funded through some sort of tax revenue. Um, it, while that exists, and even in the US, uh, we also included examples where it's partial, like your downtown free transit zone, uh, RIP, and um, the uh, time-based ones, so um, Chengdu, China has it free before 7 a.m. to try and convince people to travel then. Um, or what is most common in the US, uh, free for certain groups of people, but not for everyone. Um, so all of those are included. Um, but so for this, I'm just going to talk about sort of the three main justifications and then the challenges um, that cities face and how they try to overcome them. Um, so the economics argument, which is the most common one in the US, focuses on ways that it can be cheaper to operate a free system or places where other beneficiaries of transit are willing to cover the gap from lost fares. Um, and so 
the th model that most often occurs in branding transit in the US is a three-legged stool, right? So you get user fares, you get beneficiaries, so businesses usually will contribute something, and then overall tax revenue often from property tax. So what free transit does is it takes away the user fares. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind is the size of the gap, the size that fare revenue is already covering um, matters a lot in how easy it is to, to win the fight. Um, so in the US, um, mostly what we see are college towns, small towns, and ski resorts that are running this uh, because even when they put in the system, they saw it was more expensive to enforce it than it was uh, to gather the revenues. This also applies to a lot of the small European cities um, that do that. The beneficiary pays model is probably the most exciting one in the US, um, and it's the basis of something like the University Pass campaign. It is actually cheaper for UW in the long run to fund transit than it is to build parking time after time. Um, <laughs> the caveat is it's cheaper as long as the system is usable by the people who are driving in, right? So I wrote my, my, college my college master's thesis or whatever on the fact that Smith actually could not do that because Smith College in Massachusetts did not have a bus system that served more than 10% of its employees. You guys don't have that problem, and so obviously it makes sense to have a university pass. Um, the, other, the other examples of this are something like the downtown fare zones, where they were put in place by businesses who saw their retail leaving to the suburbs, and they said it would be so much better if you guys would come down here and we'll make it free and easy. Um, so these kinds of beneficiary pays are where we've seen a lot of it in the US. Other economic justifications that have happened outside are towns in Greece that actually use free public transit as a way to promote the city, um, or the Chengdu example where they used it to try and spread the peak, which didn't work for them, but doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't um, otherwise. The second justification is environmental, um, which is a big one. It's the reason that Paris is thinking about it. I don't know if you guys saw the news or the post in the Facebook page, uh, but Paris is seriously exploring free public transit in the city. The, the difficulty when thinking about mode shift is um, we don't actually see vast shifts of ridership just based on fares alone. Um, uh, this depends, first of all, on um, how expensive the system was to begin with, but also how many people are already getting a discount, right? So in Bologna, they did get a 50% increase. They were one of the first people to try it. Um, but they also, at the same time, <coughs> removed or restricted cars from three quarters of the city's roads um, and put in bus lanes. So we can't actually untangle what's the fare and what's the service improvement. Um, put the mic a little bit farther. Yes. Sorry. Cool. My bad. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, so Bologna would be one example. Belgium is another, or Hesselt Belgium is another one that people use um, <coughs> that sees, they saw a 13 times increase in ridership. Well, they also pedestrianized their city center, removed uh, two lanes from their inner ring road, um, and built sort of giant parking ride lots um, outside the city and then funneled people in. So reshaping your city to run on transit is a really good idea. It will increase <coughs> ridership. It's not necessarily thoroughly linked to the free ridership question. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are really good ways in which um, the, the shifts can actually provide sort of the same economic savings where your budgets allow you to sort of transfer back and forth, right? So Lubin, Poland saved $300,000 from not penalizing fare dodgers anymore, um, which is a fifth of what it costs to run fare transit, free transit. They were lucky enough that they had a system where they could transfer those costs, those savings, from one department <coughs> to another. Um, in Hasselt, they actually ended up um, no longer providing free transit, in part because all the savings they were getting from the way the city was running better um, couldn't go to sort of cover the transportation. Um, so that's, a, that's one thing to sort of think about. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that even though they did all of those many things, 80% of the town is still Using, using a car. So when we think about the environmental benefits, um, there are ways to do it and there are ways to do it right, but it definitely depends on what else you're doing to improve your transit system. I think for me, the, the best argument, um, the most exciting argument and the one that really matters um, 
is the question of uh, rights-based arguments, right? It's that the public transit is a right. Access should not be determined by ability to pay. Um, and this argument has multiple facets, which are incredibly important. I think for me, the most important is it entangles with the racist enforcement practice. It entangles with the way in which transit fares are complicit in the system of racialized capitalism that occurs and the ways in which by having a system where that is policed, we end up with a system that is um, unjust and does not allow everyone to use that system with equal dignity. Um, so I'm sure there are Seattle statistics, but the ones that I know best are LA and New York. In New York, it's the single biggest um, source of arrests for youth of color. In LA, more than 50% of the fines and arrests for fare evasion were of black riders, even though blacks are only 19% of the LA population. Um, and for what it's worth, your sister bus riders union in LA is currently fighting for free transit and a 50% reduction in the MTA police budget based on those statistics. Um, the other sort of part that it opens up is the idea of transit as a public space, which of course is related to the enforcement. Um, but it also sort of um, increases the use of transit as a public sphere and the conception of public transport as sort of a municipal responsibility. Um, in some ways, people who use the efficiency argument, like Chengdu's um, peer spreading, and they also have free community buses, the, this is actually something where the city itself doesn't recognize that it's having a little bit of a transformative, um, non-reformist reform, if you will. But the fact is that because those buses have no enforcement at all, they're the only public service in the city that can be used by people who are not legal residents, mm -hmm. which then provides them actually better access in those communities and is a sort of model for how to do it um, for other services, which they didn't mean to do, but they ended up doing. Um, so in the US, one sees the rights-based arguments less on sort of transit as a whole and more for particular social groups. So it is standard practice in US transit systems to do at least reduced fares for the elderly, disabled, and often youth. Um, in uh, some cities, particularly San Francisco, um, they've gone full free. Um, some places also have free transit for veterans, uniform military, et cetera. Um, the issue here is sort of um, deciding whether people are worthy of it or not, which can be pretty problematic. Um, one just side note, uh, I interviewed New York City's Swipe It Forward campaign as part of this chapter, and they were very vehement in the idea that they are not a campaign for fair free public transit. In fact, they are a campaign for black liberation to provide a space for black people to move through the city with dignity, um, which I think they're right that they're, well, they are saying they're not a movement, that's fine, but I also think that the more that we understand free public transit as a way to create space for people to move through the city with dignity, sort of the better off we are. Um, now, sort of having said that, um, shifting to the challenges a bit, the more we open up transportation as a public space, particularly in the US, the more it becomes responsible for other failures of the public sector. Note that I'm using responsible here in the way that Iris Marianne Young, who you should all read, she's a great politi political philosopher, um, she says responsibility is the ability to take action, not the source of blame, right? So um, we're not at fault, but it does mean that one of the things that comes up when people talk about fair free transit is um, that public transit becomes a space for um, inebriated folks, folks who don't have a place to go, um, and rebellious youth. Um, and this was in fact the main reason that, it, that the experiment in Austin in the 1990s stopped. Um, the driver's union voted to go back to taking fares even though they had hated it because they preferred it to policing the bus. Um, and so what we need in terms of when we think about this, particularly in the US context, is innovative solutions to um, sort of address those issues, particularly ones that come at it from the focus on the rights of the homeless and those who are using that space, rather than a managing the problem kind of solution. Um, it's also true that in cities where they did see ridership increases, that problem was less of a big deal. Um, it's, a, it's sort of the more eyes on the street Jane Jacobs issue may, may solve it on its own. Um, and then the other one that lots of people come up with is uh, how do you pay for it? 
Um, and I think that much like there's no one justification that is most salient in every city, there's also no one way to pay. Um, in the US, we like to force our taxes to have some relationship to what is being, uh, to what is being provided. But in fact, in many countries, that is not a requirement at all. And it's easiest to think of funding as a manifestation of political will, right? If enough people are willing to fight for a thing, it will get funded. And it's also worth noting that we don't mandate that road maintenance like charge every time we do a new thing. Um, that said, there are sort of three interesting funding streams that um, exist in cities that have tried it and that have made it easier to do it. The first um, and most interesting is that in France, there's a payroll tax that is available to any city over 100,000 people by default, and you can also opt into it um, between 20,000 and 100,000. It's roughly 1% of the payroll of all employers um, with more 11 employees. Y'all are dealing with this already, but um, the taxes on the total income of employees. Um, right now in Paris, uh, it's 40% of the transportation agency's budget compared to fares, which are 28%, which is something that they're thinking about is how could we bump it up to cover that extra 30%. Um, in Auvergne, it was, it was already um, being used to pay for a tram, and they just sort of added a little bit more um, to cover that. The second is an annual transit pass, um, which doesn't really then feel like fare-free transit, but what it enables is the ability to use the transit system as though it were free. Um, and also, one model that's proposed in Germany and has been proposed in academia is having you buy it as part of your income tax um, or in, as part of your tax system in general and just saying um, it's a share of your income rather than a particular fixed price, um, which again, if you had an income tax, that would be helpful. Um, and uh, the other version, which is practically fare free, is um, like a city ID card that may come with a small fee that then enables you to use uh, transit um, as well as other public services. And this is the model that's used in the German town of Templin that may become the model if Germany follows through on um, its na nationwide sort of consideration of fare-free transit. Because one of the cool things to keep in mind is that we're actually seeing a pretty big wave of places considering this as they're sort of looking for climate-based and justice-based uh, solutions to city problems. Um, and the last one is, uh, that sort of everyone really wants but no one has done in practice is a land tax differentiated by accessibility, right? So the more accessibility provided by your transit system, the more you pay in property tax, which essentially just sort of replicates the way land taxes should be working anyway, because it should be in the value of the land. Um, it's related to sort of a tax increment financing. It's been crudely applied in London to all the places uh, that, to all the businesses that should be positively impacted by Crossrail, but it's not um, sort of fancy. They just were like, this borough got it, and this borough got it, so you guys should have a tax. Um, so this is sort of the, the methods of financing that are most useful, but again, it really makes sense what contexts are legal and what is available in your, in your legal system. So to sort of sum it up, the full free fare public transit is most clearly a signaling device, right? It's a demonstrated commitment to public transit, emphasis on the public and emphasis on transit, the ability to get to where you're going. Um, to be successful in achieving the environmental goals, it has to be coupled with efforts to prioritize public transportation, which is stuff that's already happening in Seattle. Um, it's, you, you're going to get the ridership shifts if you improve the system. You're going to get, they're going to matter more if your system is then also free. Um, but also to be equitable, it really needs to be carried out with as little enforcement as possible. It's the ability to take the fare box off the bus, to take the fare enforcement team off the bus um, that really makes it possible. Um, and as for efficiency, what we know is that the economics of a policy seem to work out when the, your, cover, your fares are already less than sort of 40 percent of uh, the total cost of the system. And the cool thing about that is it means that the more incremental fights we win, the more people we get covered, the more places we get covered, the more routes we get covered, the more little bits we find to cover those gaps, the easier the eventual fight to make public transit free becomes, which means that every single win you guys are winning matters to this fight in a pretty cool way. Um, and I think given that, I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel to talk about how you won that. No.
group. So just wanted to know that we're growing as a group and as people, I'm sure. So if you wouldn't mind, if you see an empty seat next to you, if you could all scooch in towards the middle, just so us folks trickle in, they'll be able to see those spots and take a seat. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Rosalie. That was uh, fascinating and informative. Um, one more housekeeping thing. Those of you who sat in these seats um, have a couple of handouts. Other people may not have gotten those handouts. Um, if you didn't, um, Matthew over there hopefully can help you um, get, uh, get those handouts. Okay, so um, now uh, I'm sure that you all have lots of questions and comments after uh, Rosalie's presentation. If you can hold your thoughts, maybe jot them down. We're going to hear from the rest of our panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion. Um, so now we're going to hear, uh, we're going to sort of zoom in to Seattle and King County. Um, since the Transit Riders Union was founded in 2011-2012, Fares, or, or when the Transit Riders Union was founded, fares had just increased several times in rapid succession. This was during the Great Recession, uh, partly as a response to the nosedive in sales tax revenues that occurred uh, during those years. So affordable transit really quickly became our core issue. Um, in fact, our first big campaign was a protest against the elimination of the Ride Free Area, a zone in downtown Seattle where transit was free, um, starting in the early 1970s uh, until it was eliminated in 2012. Um, so the handout that you should uh, have had on your seat shows some of the progress that we've made here in Seattle and King County uh, towards the goal of free public transit. Um, and one thing that you'll see if you read the text on this handout is that our power really comes from solidarity and from grassroots community organizing. When we've won, it's because we've worked together with allies and we've built powerful coalitions that get things done. So on that note, I would like to introduce uh, Ifra Abshir. Uh, three years ago, when Ifra was a student at Rainier Beach High School, uh, she was a leader in the campaign to win free transit passes for low-income students. Um, her energy and initiative and her leadership among her fellow students were instrumental in the success of that campaign. And Ifra is now, I believe, a pre-med student here at the University of Washington. And so this is for our recorder over there. Okay. So if you can clip it. And the mic works better if it's not too close to your Okay, got you, got you. Okay, hello. Cool. Um, first, I'd like to apologize for coming a little bit late. I had just finished up uh, evening prayers. Um, on that note, one Madame Mubarak to anybody who's fasting this month. Uh, so yeah, like um, Katie said, my name is Efrah and I went to Rainy Beach High School um, four years, my whole high school career. But um, So I guess I'll just start with the origins of like how we got involved as Rainy Beach High School. Um, but a little background on Rainy Beach before I begin. So Rainy Beach High School is a school that's predominantly students of color, so 95% of our population, um, over 50 languages are spoken. And um, on that note, also, yeah, we're also probably like one of the blackest high schools left in Seattle with like gentrification and the movement and all of that. So Rainy Beach is kind of like a school that's always been um, pushed aside. Like our school was built in 1960 and we're the only school in Seattle that hasn't had a renovation yet. Um, so we're literally like using tables and chairs from 1960. Um, so that's kind of like the background context. Um, so we're used to fighting at Rainy Beach. We're used to fighting from everything from water bottles, not water bottles, working water fountains uh, to um, adequate teaching staff to um, less assessments. We're used to fighting. So this was kind of like another fight that we took on. But um, So I guess this started in 2015. Um, the summer of 2015, uh, it was when a program called Freedom Schools, Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools, was hosted at Rainy Beach High School 2015, the first summer it was um, at the B uh, Rainy Beach High School. So basically it's a six-week um, program, but it accumulates to a social action activity <coughs> at the end of those six weeks. And um, that social action activity is dependent on the participants, dependent on the scholars, what they self-select. Um, and it's a national program, so people do this all over. They talk about things from food hunger, to food deserts, to racism, to different types of isms, and patriarchy, all that. Um, but the Rainy Beach students decided that they want to address transportation equity. Because, as we know, that if you live um, to within a two-mile walk zone, uh, you have to walk and not qualify for an ochre card. So every day, like these students were walking two miles, plus miles, um, facing all types of things like harassment, sexual harassment, um, um, 
violence, everything that was going on, right? So then um, these, ki uh, these scholars, really not even kids, but these scholars decided that they wanted to address that because what good is having free lunch if you can't get transportation to school? If, if you're qualified for free lunch, you pay $1.50's lunch, right? But if you can't pay that and you qualify for free lunch, then why are you paying $3 for transportation to school? That's like double the amount for lunch, right? So it just didn't make sense mathematically or anything, especially because you have schools um, who don't really have these problems, right? Like some schools are fighting for parking lot spots because there's so many kids who drive. Um, and people at Rainy Beach would host like carpool days and things of that matter, right? So the kids decided that, the scholars, again, um, not kids, scholars, decided that they were going to address that. So then they marched from uh, the John Stansford Center of Education to City Hall, which is roughly like two miles, the amount of miles that they would walk every single day back and from, from school. And they were chanting, they had signs. And then we met the elementary school, Freedom School site at the, um, at the City Hall. And then that was kind of the beginning of the movement. Because as we know, movements don't happen overnight and they don't happen one day. So it's kind of an accumulation of years, uh, of months really, right? Like things from like walking uh, elected officials to our school to see like how that walk plays out, to hosting rallies, to, to emails, to phone calls, to just disruption, to everything possible to make people know that like, that like this two miles is, 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 um, is really like detrimental to a student's education because if they come to school late, because they miss the bus, then they miss school, and if you miss school, then you end up in detention, and if you end up with uh, detention, you can fall into the school to prison pipeline, also you won't even get breakfast, right, because you're too late for breakfast. So there's all these things that really affect the student's character, um, a student's life, really, beyond high school, that portray out because of the access to transportation. And as you know, students of color, like black, black and brown youth, have um, the lowest access to transportation. And then a lot of times, our students will go on the bus, um, the trains, without paying fares and then they will risk, again, fall into that school, uh, school to prison pipeline because you have fare enforcement, like, like was talked about earlier, um, always stopping or always like there, you know? So it was just like, basically it was a negative situation all around and we addressed it and then it came down to having, um, having the Oka Cards uh, campaign. It was, it was known to us and known to the city that there's gonna be a million dollars allocated towards Oka Cards for us to, uh, kids off free introduced lunch who live within that two mile walk zone. Um, and that was, I guess, the beginning of our movement. Um, so that was cool. And then, uh, I guess, I don't know the exact numbers, but thousands of Oka cards were distributed, and I, I guess thousands of dollars were saved um, and bought back to these families from not having to pay the Oka card fees. And it was cool. And then fast forward, like, um, recently, where the mayor had announced that now that policy was going to be extended to all Seattle Public School students, anybody that's an SPS gets Oka card. Um, and basically, when we heard about it at Rainy Beach, I had graduated. Um, this is my second year here at UW, so I had been graduated. But um, when Rainy Beach students themselves, some of them who are still in high school heard about it, um, a lot of them kind of had mixed emotions about it because a lot of them were like, yeah, that's cool, you know what I mean? Like, we have Oka cards uh, because of us, but a lot of other ones, on the other hand, were like, but there was no acknowledgement of Rainy Beach's struggle for this. There was no, like, Rainy Beach was not on the news. Rainy Beach was not known. Like, it was just, it just seemed as if, like, the mayor had announced this as if it was an original idea um, between her and her folks or between whoever, the powers that be. Um, so a lot of students were kind of angry at that, that there was no, there was not um, uh, more mention of, like, the grassroots activism, the years that it took, right? Like, students were invested in this year. Some students are graduating now that were in the program, that were in film schools that year. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of like the movement. And what, what's going on now is that a lot of students at Beach have been telling their own stories. So stay, t stay tuned for that. But a lot of students have been documenting like the transit movement when they got involved, what's going on now. Um, but I guess that's where Rainy Beach and myself comes into the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ifra. I'm just gonna hold this since I'm about to give it to someone else. Okay, um, so uh, the next, our next speaker is um, Alex Finch, uh, who is a board member of the Seattle uh, Housing and Resource Effort, better known as SHARE, um, and a resident of SHARE's Tent City Three. So ever since our Ride Free Area campaign, the Transit Riders Union has worked in close collaboration with Share, Wheel, and Nicholsville um, on many campaigns, including uh, winning better transit access for homeless and very low income riders through King County's Human Services Bus Ticket Program. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Alex to tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> I 
Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Greetings, fellow riders of the bus. <laughs> My name is Alex Finch, and like Katie said, I live at Share Wheels 10 City 3. It's America's longest running outdoor encampment. <laughs> we <clears throat> move around Greater Seattle every couple of months, and almost always we take the bus. Except right now, when we are taking the light rail all the way to Tukwila, where we are located just three blocks from the station. Our bus tickets are part of the package while staying at 10 City 3, which we self-manage ourselves with next to no staff. Why, you might ask, do our bus tickets only cost share 10 cents on the dollar? Our community, Share, realized a long time ago that public transportation was essential for us to have communities of homeless people living throughout Seattle. <clears throat> That's why one of our first bites was to get bus tickets at a reduced rate from Metro. That started in 1992, and no, I wasn't around then. I was in a car seat at the time, I believe. <laughs> it started, um, share started paying 25% of cost, and then it went down to 20%, and now it's at 10 cents on the dollar. The fact is that last reduction took place with the formation of our city coalition, coalition with the Transit Riders Union. We think it's another example of why the definition of union is something people can do together that they can't do by themselves. I hope I have the chance to read the book that this gathering is about. <laughs> the more public transportation is free or low cost, the more opportunities we'll have to work together and achieve victories in other areas. Speaking of victories, I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone here who fought for the employee hours tax that the City Council just passed and the mayor just signed last Monday. Together we'll keep on winning. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Confused. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm just going to stand here to introduce our next speaker. So um, we had been hoping that both uh, Councilmember uh, O'Brien and Councilmember Mosqueda would be able to join us this evening, but they both had um, uh, urgent uh, other things that they had to do. Um, so uh, in their place, I would like to welcome Michael Maddox, um, who is a legislative aide to Councilmember Teresa Mosqueda. Give it up, give it up. I got a microphone right here, so. All right, let me put this on first. They don't need to hear me on the camera, do they? Gosh. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Maddox, and I work for Seattle City Council Member Teresa Mosqueda. Uh, Council Member Mosqueda chairs the Housing, Health, Energy, and Worker Rights Committee uh, for the Seattle City Council and really views the issue of transit access and mobility as something that ties into a lot of the work that we are doing on our committee and we're trying to lead within our city with respect to access to transit, access to mobility as a means of public health and as part of the overall strategy that we look at when we're talking about housing access and affordable housing in the city of Seattle. Uh, as many of you, as was just alluded to, we recently just passed uh, the employee hours tax at City Council and was signed by the mayor to help fund some of the affordable housing needs that we have within the city of Seattle. Uh, but a part, none of that really matters if people can't have housing that is close to where they need to be or have transit that connects people to where they need to be. And this is one of the ongoing themes that we hear time and again. Uh, back in uh, January, Councilman Mosqueda on the days of City Council uh, made a comment that she believes that we need to be moving forward as a city to ensuring that all people in our city have access to transit, to public transit, regardless of their ability to pay. And if that means driving fares all the way down to zero, that's the thing that we should do. Uh, we sent out a tweet to that effect, and uh, I believe that that has been the most seen, liked, and retweeted thing we've ever done. Uh, it still comes back to haunt me to this day, and I mean that in a good way, and that people are still saying, here's new ways that we can do that. Here's some ideas. Uh, and, and we hear that not just from writers, not just from youth. I have a 15-year-old son who gets around by bus uh, everywhere that he goes. Uh, he's uh, turning 16 in December and not even talking about getting a driver license because he's got an ORCA card right now. Uh, and, and I think that's the way that we want to try to get folks to go, try to get kids to go if we're going to be living up to our environmental credentials as a city trying to uh, reduce our carbon uh, uh, footprints in the world and be a leader on that. But we also hear it from transit drivers. Uh, my mom, she's a Metro driver, ATU member, uh, working out of North Base. And they, 
what I hear, and, and this was alluded to, policing the bus. Drivers don't want to be the ones policing the bus. And by trying to make fare enforcement part of their job, they are forced to police the bus. And it creates, uh, oftentimes, what we hear in our office, it creates situations that are less than comfortable and can lead to more assaults, more people spitting on drivers, and more situations that are uncomfortable slow down transit and, no, make, sure, and make it so nobody can get to where they need to be uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, and then so we then turn to the question of, well, should we then have fare enforcement? Uh, I recently sent out a tweet from my own personal account after there were four fare enforcement officers on a sound transit line I was riding uh, and learned via the Twitter that the fare enforcement dollars that they recover don't actually go back into the system. And from what I can tell, they don't actually pay for fare enforcement either. And so then we get to the question of what is the point? Um, is the point to actually enforce fares to make sure that we're bringing more money in or is the point to dissuade people from using transit? And the, I think the idea then turns to, well, clearly to dissuade people from using transit, we want people to use transit in the city of Seattle. So how do we fund that as an ongoing conversation that we have? Um, as was alluded to earlier, there's a lot of constraints that we have within the state of Washington. Um, who here remembers Initiative 695 from 1998? So Initiative 695 was Tim Iman's second gem. His first was Initiative 200, which is also terrible. Uh, but 695 was his second gem, and that gutted funding for transit and libraries throughout the state of Washington, as well as fire departments. And what that did was it created, quote, $30 car tabs and eliminated the motor vehicle excise tax, which was one of the more progressive ways we were able to fund transit in all parts of the state. Uh, at the time, I was a teenager living in Snohomish County and saw dramatic decreases in access to transportation as a result. Uh, and so since then, uh, it was ruled unconstitutional, and our state legislature, in their infinite wisdom, reinstated the, uh, uh, the, the ban on, an, on a motor vehicle excise tax for the purposes of transit connectivity. So for the current moment, that's out. And so we looked at other options. Um, so, and I, one thing that I heard was potentially looking at ways that we can extract more funds from uh, transit-rich uh, properties. And unfortunately, when we look at that, we run into situations around the question of the uniformity clause of the state constitution with respect to property taxes. Uh, this is rearing its ugly head again with income taxes in the state of Washington as income property. All right, I heard one no. That was, that, that was a call line. I'm terrible at those things. Um, and so we then look to what are some new ways. And this is one thing that I, I'm excited about that we're working on on the second floor at City Hall. Uh, you know, the first is the expansion of, uh, the, of the ORCA card for uh, folks in our schools and high schools, and I believe in middle schools as well, um, as uh, proposed by Mayor Durkin, which is building off of the great work that was done by the folks down at Rainier Beach High School, by the students at Rainier Beach High School. So I think we de they deserve another hand right now. Uh, you know. And I can tell you that our office remembers, I know that Councilmember Johnson's office remembers, and Councilmember O'Brien's office remembers, and we will definitely be driving that home as that conversation uh, continues. Uh, and that's happening as a result of some extra funding that, was, uh, that looks like it's going to be available in the Transportation Benefit District. So that's one piece. But then what about the rest? That's students. So we have one, one group that we could potentially take care of. So there's other ways that we're looking at in the city to potentially um, expand access to transit uh, uh, access throughout the city. One would be an employer-based uh, pre-tax benefit for folks to get ORCA cards through their employer. But again, that only covers some folks. What about people who don't have an employer? What about people who are on fixed incomes or are senior citizens? And so we're also looking at additional models uh, through, like the, through the housing levy, through affordable housing uh, complexes to provide housing-based um, options for folks to potentially have that free ORCA card as we identify the funding sources necessary to get to that uh, reducing it down to a free pass throughout the city of Seattle, uh, which I think is very important for us to be uh, trying to do, again, if we're going to try to keep ourselves as a getting to zero carbon uh, city. Of course, none of this matters if buses are stuck in traffic. And so one thing I would encourage all of you to do throughout uh, uh, your tenure of engagement with the city is ensure that as we look at things like a quote reset and quote on uh, the Let's Move Seattle levy, that we are prioritizing things like transit and pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. Uh, and bicycle safety is very important to me. I got hit by a car, which is why I'm in this thing right here, uh, while I was biking home one day. And so we need to ensure that all ages and all mobilities have opportunity to get around and get around safely throughout the city of Seattle. And one way to do that is through transit prioritization. It's, it's, it's fantastic to hear cities doing uh, three quarters of their downtown streets as dedicated transit right of way. That improves reliability of transit and eliminates the uh, reason for folks to have to, to, quote, have to, and quote, drive into downtown if they can't take transit and rely upon it. Uh, and then this all ties back into, again, public health and housing. 
the comment was made about, I keep on looking to you because you have so many great things. Uh, <laughs> the, the question about policing folks on the bus. And if, if we have people who have nowhere else to be, and there's free transit, and that's the only place that they feel safe or feel comfortable because there's nowhere else to be, that's a problem. And that's why we must continue to ensure we're having the adequate investment in the affordable housing component, in the day-centric component, in the activities for people to do during the day component. Because when we do that in conjunction with the uh, investments in transit access and connectivity throughout the city of Seattle, everybody wins. Uh, people who want to get to and from work win. People who want to get to and from appointments win. People who want to be in a place and feel safe and comfortable with friends and family win. So it's all connected and that's, all we, that's one of the things that we definitely want to implore from our position on the second floor is the connectivity of all these issues as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, so while Michael is uh, passing the two microphones over, um, so we're now going to pivot to the present and the future. Um, and if you flip over the, the timeline that um, hopefully you all have a copy of, you'll see some information about a campaign that's just launching now. Uh, pressuring the University of Washington to get with the times and provide full transit benefits to their workers. So here with us uh, to talk a little bit more about this effort is Elizabeth uh, Bowerly. Yes. Good. Elizabeth is a medical lab scientist at UW Medical Center who sits on the University Transportation Committee. She has been on campus for 15 years as a student, researcher, and graduate student. Please welcome Elizabeth. So thank you, thank you all for welcoming us, and, and thank you to all the excellent panel speakers. It was great to hear everything that you've had to say. Um, and I'm excited to be here talking about free public transit, um, because I've used public transit from a very young age. And I'm really excited that these stories from around the world are being collected into one spot. Um, I also mourned the loss of the ride-free zone downtown, not because it limited my mobility financially, but because it limited my incentive to use public transit. If it was gonna cost me more than $5 to go into the city and back because I went shopping and then had to pay again, or to the movies and then had to pay again to go to dinner, I might as well drive. Last year, for example, I celebrated with Husky women's basketball team on campus here as they headed off to the NCAA Final Four, then headed downtown for a day in the city. Transit that day cost me $10. A bus to Husky Stadium, celebrate with the team, move on to use the, light, the new open light rail downtown, and then I bust to connect to the Seattle Center, and then I bust home. Like it was said, I work at UW Medical Center, and um, I work swing shift, so I've looked into a lot of commute options. Um, the transportation office ran my addresses and tried to give me a carpool or bus, and they came up with nothing. Um, because my evening shift is outside the regular transit hours, and because I live in Shoreline, where I can afford a house <laughs> to rent. Um, there is no bus line um, all the way to my house in one shot. I would have to transfer. Many of my coworkers have to transfer. Um, the efficient bus is the 512 up the freeway, and that is two miles from my house. Um, the less efficient bus is the E, <laughs> um, which is fun at midnight. <laughs> Um, so I, I choose to drive. I'm one of those people that usually drives um, and I park at, over at Husky Stadium and I walk back and forth in the dark to my, to my car, especially in the winter. Um, and you guys may know that this is also Bike Everywhere Month, which I have been doing and participating in. So I bike the 10 miles in and then I bike home with the 512, which is very efficient. Um, and I'm still paying for my monthly parking pass here on campus because I don't want to lose my spot when Bike Everywhere Month is over. Um, but using the 512, it only takes me 20 more minutes to get home. And this is where this ties into the free transit. If my pass was free, I wouldn't care about 20 minutes. I would take 20 minutes and getting the exercise and not having to go to the gym. That's 20 minutes I didn't go to the gym. Hooray, my gym's done. Um, so a free bus from my employer would make this an attractive commute option to me, even at midnight. <laughs> um, and the University of Washington, I've been here 15 years, I've been here in every role. I really do think that they pride themselves on, their high on setting high standards and they put them out on their websites. Things like UW Medical Center is your home for world-class care, anywhere in the Puget Sound. <laughs> um, that they're number four in public institutions by the Times Higher Education and that they're number five for our best value college by Forbes magazine. One of the places that they don't hold up is by offering employee benefits such as a simple 
transit pass. Um, we have a link already right to campus. We have a second station coming to North Campus in just a few years. We are a major hub for most North Seattle buses. Um, there's 50,000 people that come to campus every day. That's more than a lot of cities. Um, so there's a lot of reason for UW to be leading with a free UPass for its employee. 50,000 people are coming here. That's a city's worth of people. Um, and I guess I actually spoke to the Board of Regents and, and I told them, no matter who we want to compare ourselves to as the university, we're lagging. Because if we compare ourselves to other hospitals in the region, other hospitals such as Children's are offering free transit, they're offering bike incentives, they're making sure that their employees are incentivized to come to work by transit. Um, if we offer, if we look at other universities, they're offering free Orca cards. If, we are, if we're looking at tech companies, Microsoft not only has financed bus routes, but they've also got their own uh, buses that they're, at, yeah, their access buses. Um, and they're putting out to the city their master 10-year plan, um, and they want to be a tech incubator. So if they want to compare to tech companies, they want to be offering free bus passes. Um, and as a state employer, other state staff in King County have free bus passes. <laughs> Um, so despite having to pay for U-Passes, there are still many employees that are trying to make transit work for them. Uh, earlier this month we were at a Regents meeting and it was shared that there's an employee that is spending the night at the UW Medical Center locker room because his shift, he works the same shift as I do, gets off at 11.30 and the bus is no longer running to his neighborhood. So he sleeps at UW until the 5 a.m. buses start to run and then he rides home. Oh. <laughs> Um, this is his option, commute option to work, and he's making an effort to use it despite the obstacles. Um, as I shared, it's Bike to Work Month, and I can connect with transit, so this would be more, uh, like, this would eliminate some of the transfers that I would need to do. Other union members are transferring two or three times and out more, more than an hour on the bus to connect to campus whether because of finances, environmental conservancy, or endorsement of the UW's purported value of having employees use empl public transit, these coworkers are trying to make public transit work for them. When surveyed, 50% of employees said that a free U pass would have them change their habits and start using public transit as their primary commute option. This change in ridership would free up spaces for our donors to come to campus, our campus visitors that want to see the cherry blossoms, <laughs> Um, and also patients, which would improve, and fam patients' families, which would really improve some satisfaction. Um, and so the university can really show that it's a world-class employer and community member by providing free, this free U-Pass. Um, 6,000 people have signed petitions that are part of the campus life. Uh, they're part of the local community, showing that this is a priority um, for this area. 30 neighborhood partners have, are also endorsing this request. Uh, the UW has, uh, and for example, like this is kind of where my mind goes. When the UW says that they'll recognize free transit as an important employee benefit, verging on a right, then they can start lobbying transit for a, from a position of strength. They can start addressing crazy things like sleeping overnight in locker rooms and start requesting more services to the neighborhoods that their employees actually live in. Um, I was in a transportation actually this morning, and it was brought up that instead of expanding service between cities, the Sound Transit Route 586, which connects downtown UW to downtown or UW to downtown Tacoma, has actually cut service runs. And this is a bus that I've actually personally utilized. I used to live in Tacoma, um, and there's no longer a midday bus south for the students. And the last bus leaves here at 6:20 p.m., which means if you take the last bus to getting to campus, which arrives at about 9:10 you have to leave and you've only worked eight hours, you're not the eight and a half that is a regular shift. Um, and nurses getting off from the medical center at 7.30 p.m. are left out entirely. They, they would have to go downtown and make a connection and now you're on the bus for an hour. Um, issuing for you passes shows the university values that their employees will use the public transit and we can see more stories like yet another route I've used, the Metro Route 373 from Shoreline. This bus used to come onto campus at the earliest at 7, 13 a.m., so I did not use it. I used a different route um, because it was not early enough for me to make my medical staff shift, which usually starts at 7, or business school students, their first class of day starts at 7. Um, so now there's a bus that comes at 6.30 a.m. and 6.45 a.m., making this a much more attractive route for staff and students living in Shoreline. 
Um, a free U pass means a change in ridership, means more leverage for improving neighborhood routes where we live, um, rapid rides and express routes so that we aren't spending our lives transferring endlessly or camped out at bus stops. Between lobbying for ourselves and having an institution that is helping back up our choice to use public transit with a free pass, the transit companies are going to have to start looking at providing public transit. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I uh, want to tell you a few things that you can do to help us uh, win this campaign and get the UW to step up. Um, so on the um, back of uh, the timeline at the bottom, where it says, here's what you can do to help us win this campaign. So um, if before you leave today, you can get on your phone and go to transitriders.org slash action, uh, that will take you to a form email where you can send an email that will go to uh, UW President Anna Marie Kause, um and uh, several other uh, key UW administrators who are trying to put pressure on you. Uh, you can also, if you're someone who does social media type stuff, is you can tweet your support. If you go to the link there, there's a button that will sort of populate a tweet for you that you can change around if you like. Um, and then finally, this week, um, Matthew over there and myself are going to be leading a couple of postering sessions on the UW campus. The dates and times are there, and I think we have some sign-up sheets over there. So before you leave, if you're able to help us out for an hour or two, um, put your name there. And actually, I think we have a big stack of posters over there as well. Um, I think there's small ones, too. Um, and so if you're someone who is on or around UW campus and you can you know, stick some in the inside of bathroom stalls or on bulletin boards or on telephone poles, uh, that'll help us to get the word out around campus. Tell people the hashtag for Twitter. Oh, hashtag UW pass or fail. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and then finally, uh, before we open up to questions and comments here, um, there's a half sheet that you should have uh, which has some possible next steps in our uh, efforts to move toward free transit here in Seattle and King County. Um, and we'd like to know what you think, so if you want to sort of rank those uh, six ideas in order of what you think uh, is the most important um, and uh, make sure that we get it before you leave. Um, that will be some interesting information for Transit Riders Union members as we think about what our next steps are. Um, so with that, um, questions and comments. I think I'll take maybe a few from the audience and then give the panelists uh, a chance to respond. Okay, so I see Shelly and then do you want a microphone sure. or do you want to just shout? I can, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Shelly Cohen. I'm a real change vendor, a board, and also a member of the board of real change. And Winter Elementary Hospital <laughs> Crossing Park. Represent uh, Senator Chase came up with an idea because she did not like the head of that. Her suggestion is to change the property tax to include intangible assets. <coughs> Who purchases and owns intangible assets? The rich, primarily, and middle class. Then what you do is you lower the rate. It is a statewide. You lower the rate so that homeowners aren't going to lose their homes because of high taxes. <coughs> and then, since it's done by the property tax, there is more control than the head tax as to what the money is used for. Why not use that money for housing, for transportation, for fixing roads, for things that, and, and eliminating the sales tax, or significantly reducing, that's the most regressive tax, and place it on the property owners, who will, of course, for rent, they'll pass it on, so we're all paying it, but it's a, at a significantly lower rate so it probably costs us less and the rich, Bezos, Gates, uh, you name them, 
a hell of a lot more than they're probably going to pay under the damn head tax. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> well, the question is, uh, working with the council person, what are your thoughts? I'm going to take a couple more from the audience and then Great. respond. Um, all right, sure. So, um, you know, um, Rosalie mentioned um, that, you know, the goal, one of the goals is, you know, free public transit for, you know, the working class, right? And so, you know, my question with respect to that is, um, if you're going to try to plan on eliminating, you know, the fair enforcement, I understand that, you know, you're saying that you know, you're not bringing in as much money as it costs to enforce fares, right? For folks who can pay for it, right? Such as, you know, myself when I graduate, you know? I get a job, right? I'm not going to pay the fare if I don't have to, right? So, you know, isn't that sort of, isn't the purpose of fare enforcement, you know, sort of deterrent for people who can otherwise pay the fare, right? How will you get people who can otherwise pay the fare to pay the fare nevertheless? Okay, maybe one more and then we'll... Uh, I was, I mean, part of the fight for a free youth pass for UW employees is the general notion that employers should contribute. They should be part of the solution. And some do, as we heard, it's kind of voluntary, but you know, Seattle has been a leader on labor standards, like the $15 minimum wage, paid sick days, scheduling, you know, secure scheduling. Why not make kind of a transit pass part of a labor standard that employers, maybe over a certain size or whatever, have to either, and I know that there's this idea about pre-tax, paying it pre-tax, but actually are you the uh, folks already pay for a pre-tax? So that's not a solution for a lot of folks. We need employers that can afford it to actually have to do this as part of a labor standard in the city. Okay, so, um, and I can say something to that as well. So, Michael, do you want to start? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so, specifically on the, on the tax policy issue, uh, as, 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 as I'm learning to talk as well. As I'm sure many of you are aware, um, tax policy is very complicated in the state of Washington, uh, and it takes a long time to enact any sort of significant change or meaningful change at the state level. Um, there's a question as to whether or not uh, a tax on intangible property would be constitutional. I don't know that, uh, but I do know that right now, uh, the Democrats in Olympia hold a functional one-vote majority in the state Senate and a functional two-vote majority in the state House Representatives, um, and not all Democrats are the same. Uh, you have Democrats from places like uh, Seattle who are one brand of Democrat, you have folks from more rural areas and whatnot, and, I, and this is an important distinction. Republicans are just going to be opposed to anything like that whatsoever, uh, and so it's just going to be a non-starter for anything that would be seen as potentially helpful towards cities like Seattle, um, based off of my experience working uh, in politics in the region. And so I think that, well, that is an interesting idea and would be an admirable idea if we could see what the numbers would look like. Um, it's a long-term uh, uh, proposal to even get implementation or even a hearing in the state legislature for. In the interim, we have over 4,000 people sleeping outdoors today, um, probably over 5,000 uh, in the city of Seattle alone. And the EHT has passed as a functional uh, uh, now, uh, payroll tax of 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 percent uh, of uh, of payrolls for employers that are the top three percent in the city of Seattle. That's compared to the city of Portland, which has a payroll tax of 0.7385 percent. And so, it's really actually not that big of a of a tax or a revenue source, but it is a revenue diversification stream. Uh, that's a five-year timeline. I'm um, at this point dedicated uh, in theory towards producing affordable housing. Uh, on the Quickly, on the other uh, two, number one is fair enforcement as a means test. I think that generally the idea being that the means test really should be find more progressive uh, taxing all, um, ways or collaborative ways with uh, uh, an employer-based uh, pass to fund the transit so we don't need the fair enforcement in the first place uh, because it's not paying for itself and people are going to have the pass anyway. I think it's kind of the idea that, that our office looks at it is that people shouldn't there shouldn't be on that for fair enforcement. There shouldn't be a fair. There should be a progressive tax just pay for transit as a public service, um, which then gets to uh, the question about the uh, employer based, uh, whether it's a pretext or not as a labor right. In the interim, I do believe that the, the way to go 
for all employers in the city is, is likely going to be Councilmember O'Brien's proposal, uh, which I'm not sure if it's publicly a proposal yet, so I didn't tell you that, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, which is the, the, the pre-tax benefit concept as we work towards finding that more permanent uh, funding solution. And you're right, that, that doesn't necessarily cover UW, and that's why it's so important to support uh, the labor movement and folks like uh, uh, like, like our, our healthcare employees in the state of Washington as they try to get that equity and access to transit. I mean, also just say congrats, Seattle, on having at least a legislative staff person who had all the right answers to those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, that's what I would say, is number one, my answer to you would be why not both? Yeah. Um, you, there's enough funding needs in this state that you really do need a payroll tax and something that does capture intangible assets like transit access. And so ideally, they will both be constitutional at some point. Um, I think to the fair enforcement, um, the point of fair enforcement and getting it off is not sort of, the point of fair enforcement even now really is not means testing. The point of fair enforcement, um, so, so I think you asked like why is it, why is it there? Um, the best answer I've seen uh, is from Ruth Wilson Gilmore in her um, Beyond Bratton work, um, which is that welfare services in the United States receive their justification for existence from their ability to enforce people's um, ability to not access them. Right, this is why the Department of Education has a SWAT team. Um, it's this idea that as long as you can prevent the wrong people from using it, the welfare service is useful. Um, and I think that we need to resist that more so than anything else, and that the importance of getting fair enforcement off the bus is really to say, we're not, we're not concerned about who's the wrong people using it, we're concerned about as many people as possible using it. Um, and so the answer to how do you make sure that you, when you graduate, pay for transit, which you totally should, um, is that we have a progressive tax system that will take some of your hard-earned income and use it to fund the bus that you ride. Um, and to the last question, I would say that it's totally fair that an employer pass is a great idea and should be should become a labor standard. I know we're fighting for it. If Columbia ever came to the table, that's one of the things we're putting in our initial bargaining goals is that they should cover um, our transit because we live in New York City and it's absurd that they do not. Um, but I think making it a standard is a great idea. It just only covers workers, and we need to make sure that proposals cover as many people as possible. I'm also going to say a few things. So uh, to the fair enforcement question, this is something that we're actually dealing with on a very practical level right now um, here in King County. As you might be aware, there was a, uh, the King County's auditor's office uh, came out with a report about the rapid ride fair enforcement system, which was like really damning. Basically, like over 25% over of people who were being ticketed um, and uh, in, many, in many cases, like the tickets go to collections, it gets on their record, they, they go to the court system. Are people who are homeless or housing insecure, um, definitely disproportionately people of color. Um, and so this really damning report has sort of opened Metro up to um, being you know, pretty amenable to maybe making some big changes. Um, this is something the Transit Riders Union is working on now along with some other organizations. And they may even be willing to do a pause, which is sort of what we called for, is like, let's stop harming people now while we figure out a better system. Um, but as we try to figure out what that better system looks like, we do run up against, I mean, the, the sort of just, one justification that they give for fair enforcement is that even though it doesn't pay for itself, and even though it's harming people, if you didn't do, if there wasn't, wasn't punishment, then wouldn't everyone abuse the system, right? So that is, that is one of the arguments. Um, but they don't, there's not really evidence um, that, you know, rates of fare evasion would go up very high if, if they stopped doing punitive fare enforcement. So it's sort of an open question. And also, as the previous speakers have said, the more people have unlimited transit passes through their employer or through a reduced fare program or whatever, the less of a problem that's going to be. Um, for the employer paid transit passes, this is something the Transit Riders Union has been thinking about for several years and working with Councilman O'Brien's office on. Um, we would love to see legislation that mandates that employers provide at least some subsidy, if not a full subsidy. I mean, <coughs> big employers provide a full subsidy for transit passes. Um, I think it's something we can get to. I think that, um, I don't know how, about the, how this event became about the head tax, but um, given the- <laughs> Always about the head tax. <laughs> given the um, intensity of the debate going on right now, and uh, the, um, it's probably not the right time to uh, ask, em ask employers to uh, pay another, you know, 500 to 1,000 bucks a year per employee. Um, but that's something we can work toward. Um, any more questions, comments? Something I was 
wondering about uh, the sheet mentions giving an open public transit pass to anyone who qualifies or lives in low income housing. I recognize that the transit systems are all their own systems that all work with the ORCA system and that something like SNAP or food stamps is done on the state level and not the city and county level. But I'm almost wondering whether it would be a good idea to have a policy where if you qualify for food assistance at a state level, then you should by default qualify for a free transit pass or be able to use a, the food stamp card to be able to present it while you're on transit and have fair enforcement or fair collection waived. Just because you already have the buses on the road, you have already spent the money on the staff and the fuel, there's not really any foregone income there. You're just using the steel and the fuel you're using more effectively by allowing people who already qualify for state assistance access to the state. <coughs> so I'm just wondering if there's any ideas about that going around or... <coughs> any, any more comments, questions? Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if Elizabeth, uh, you had um, you know the things that you said posted anywhere. Is, is, is that is it floating around on the internet? Because I did not catch up what you said, and I want some email. Oh, I'm sorry. I I should have spoken up. Um, I wrote it today. Oh, okay. I can post it on the SEIU website. Um, that's my affiliation is with SEIU 95. Um, <laughs> we also so there's a website for the. Campaign, which is you dub pass, uh, you dub pass or fail the sheet, um, and we could potentially post your comments on on the website as well. But there's information, you know, some of the same things that Elizabeth said. Um, I'll respond briefly to, to what you just said. So that's sort of how the Orca Lift low income fare works. Um, so, for instance, I have a Orca Lift card. Um, and if, if the eligibility threshold is the same as it is for food stamps, so if you're 200% of the federal poverty level or under, you can go into a number of different locations, including the metro office, including public health offices, um, and you can just give them your, if you're, if you're on EBT, you can give them your you know, food stamps EBT card, or if you qualify for like Apple Health, there's a, a number of different programs that you can sort of use as proof of eligibility to get the low, low income fair worker card. Um, so that's sort of how that works, but it's not free. It's $1.50 a ride or 54 bucks a month. Um, in terms of precedent for just using other government IDs for this, I know that um, Pennsylvania, which has long provided free transit for all of its seniors, is just show your, show your ID that has your birth date on it and you can get on. Um, so there is some precedent for this sort of very simple version of that. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense as long as there is actually something that does that. I guess I actually have a clarification question on that. Would that not, would that not like having to show your EBT card? Would that not add to the stigma? Oh yeah, I mean that's something to that's something to think about. The seniors like they're kind of proud of it. I don't know. If, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was actually in, in the in the process of designing the Orca Lift program. That was one of the discussions we have about not wanting to have it be a stig, stig, uh, stigmatized thing. Um, so that's why you know you get you qualify for the program and then you get an ORCA card which is just like a normal or ORCA card. It has like an expiration date on the back, but it looks just the same and works just the same. So Rosalie, did you say China treats it, the people who are immigrants differently on the public transportation, or do some countries provide transportation for immigrants? So it's a. It's um, the Fuku system, which requires you to um, be registered essentially in the place of your birth. It's an issue right now in China. If you if you're a rural, it's an internal migration issue. So if you're a rural immigrant in a or migrant to a city, you don't necessarily qualify for city services because you're registered in your rural area and you don't really get to switch them. So the appeal of the free transit bus in China um, is that instead of needing any sort of um, pass to um, identify yourself as one or the other. On a bus where there's no enforcement, everyone just gets to ride around the community. So um, that's sort of where that Anyone else? Questions, thoughts? Yeah, in regards to the cost of fair enforcement, 
I talked with Rod's office, and apparently, she didn't give me the numbers yet, that a lot of the costs don't occur within Metro, so they're not reported as expenses. They come from other areas of the city government, or the county government in particular. So that's why one third does not, you know, our fare doesn't cover one third. It covers less because it's not incorporated in their cost. And I think it's important to find out, is it a third? Is it 20%? Maybe the fares only co cover 10% if you look at jail time, if you look at court time, costs like that. They're not included in that. Um, Might be something to look into. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any final thoughts from our panel? Okay, well, in that case, um, let's give another round of applause to all. <laughs> Make one little plug for Initiative 1631, uh, which is the uh, what are we calling it? Carbon? Carbon no, carbon fee pollution. Fee pollution. Tax pollution. No, not tax. Fee pollution. Fee on pollution. New sources of energy and new sources of transportation. Yeah. So if you haven't signed, uh, definitely a good thing to sign. Transit Writers Union has has uh, endorsed it, so it's got to be good. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I do have a Red May announcement. So, Red May is a month long uh, imagining and the capitalism teaching. And we have a ton of events coming up. Tomorrow night is Learning from Red Vienna Social Housing for a Livable Future. It's at the Center for Architecture and Design. It's going to be a wonderful talk about what we can imagine for Seattle based on that model. And um, there's going to be a speaker who's an architect that's going to be carrying the name Charlie Bailey. You're going to be speaking on a panel after. There's also an event, Community and Legal Struggles to Stop Police Violence at Kane Hall. Um, that's on Thursday night, and um, it's going to be a mix of like academic and bad abolition, as well as folks in Seattle that are leading struggles. And then Friday is uh, Building the Left America After the Standards Campaign, and that's going to be Sean Salon and other speakers as well, some folks from DSA. And then on all weekend, there's a Marxathon to dive deep into Marx, and then on the party. And, a couple of events with uh, global warming and looking at colonialism in uh, Palestine and Puerto Rico. So check out redmayseattle.org. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, and so, so we're, we're wrapping up here. The last thing I'll say is make sure you send that email because we really want President Kause to wake up tomorrow morning to 100 emails telling her she's got to do this thing. So please send that email, um, you know, do a tweet. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, make sure that you get on, uh, if you want to get announcements on the, the sign-up sheet over there to get Transit Writers Union announcements. We're going to be ramping up and doing um, some stuff around, probably around graduation, <coughs> which is in early June. Um, so stay in the loop. Uh, join the Transit Writers Union if you're not already a member. And uh, let's continue the fight for free public transit. Thank you, everyone.